Hey everyone, Jason here from River City Graphics. Well, we're working on these graphics for Bob Moore for his Detroit Miss P51 Mustang, and it seems we have a little bit of editing to do. So I thought I'd make a quick video and kind of show you uh, guys how uh, how it is that I make these graphics and, and how they end up looking so good. It's sometimes the scaling, the sizing, we might have to make a few adjustments. It all depends on what artwork we use from the get-go, and it, it seems that this particular artwork that I chose to do my tracings on may have the numbers a little bit bigger than than the actual scale size and sometimes it can be the model too if it varies a little bit in in shape and measurements from the drawings that I'm using you're going to have some deviations there as well so sometimes it's a little trial and error uh, a lot of times you just got to keep messing with it till it, it looks real good and, and and pay attention to your documentation and, uh, and make sure that everything's where it looks you know I don't have the model here if I had the model here then uh, you know everything would be perfect for, from the get-go but we don't have that so a lot of times we just have to kinda work with what we do have uh, the appropriate drawings and documentation and sometimes I nail it all of it dead on and, and sometimes we have to make a little bit of adjustments here and there so everything fits and and looks good so anyways we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and start this so, yes I uh, I have three monitors in my on my design system and uh, I'll show you why we use three monitors largely the third one here uh, and all of them are hooked together with a triple matrix in it, so I can go from one monitor to the next with all my files, and uh, that makes it kind of nice. Um, this uh, far monitor here is they're all hooked to the same computer, of course, and the far monitor I just use for emails and, and, and other things like that. And the other two monitors are used for the design software that I currently use, which is Adobe Illustrator. Now, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with Adobe Photoshop, and the two programs aren't a whole lot different. Uh, they look a lot alike. The only difference is is that Adobe Photoshop edits pixels, little tiny dots in photographs to alter the image. And that's all you're doing. You're changing the nature of the pixels by airbrushing, digitally airbrushing on them and that kind of thing. And yes, I do do a lot of that as well, photo restoration. And I'm also a photographer and we do a lot of photo editing and these kinds of things. But Adobe Illustrator is a little different in the respect that uh, it edits in vector. And what vector is, is just a series of lines on an X and Y grid. And you're just manipulating these lines and then shading the, the areas inside the lines and making different shapes. And of course, once you determine on the computer, uh, once you made a shape or a letter or a configuration on an X and Y coordinate, it's real easy to take that information over to a plotter and have the plotter either draw it out or cut it out into something, or even have a, a more sophisticated large format printer put it out. And uh, this is why uh, these shops that do these vehicle wraps and stuff like vector type programs, uh, because it works so well for that. And I don't know if you knew this, but an Adobe Illustrator doesn't necessarily have outputs directly to plotters in the software. But that doesn't mean that these uh, files can't be saved as an EPS format on a drive or, or a, a, a zip disk of some form, or a CD and take into a local sign shop and have just about anything that you can create in Illustrator uh, cut in vinyl or printed uh, you know, in on those large format printers and that kind of thing that they possess. It's pretty easy to do that. Um, just about anything, and you could take, you could do the very thing that I'm about to teach you here and make your own graphics for your own models if you have Adobe Illustrator. Uh, Adobe Illustrator doesn't take that uh, much time to learn. Its technology has been out for a long, long time. You don't need to invest in expansy, uh, fancy, expensive uh, uh, sign maker software to, to do this. You can do it right in Adobe Illustrator. You can save those files and you can take them right to your sign shop and they can cut them out in vinyl for you. And sometimes providing the artwork can save you a little bit of money, a lot of money, because a lot of these places will charge you design time in addition to the vinyl cost. So if you can save the money in the design time, I would love it if everybody brought me a disc. And I wouldn't have to mess with it, and I can just, you know, spend all my time in shop cutting, and I wouldn't have to spend any time at all designing. And that's, the design time is what really, really takes a lot of time. But if you can get people to do this stuff and train people how to do it, you can just go to the sign shop with the disc. It makes it a lot better, a lot faster, a lot quicker. So anyway, this was the image that I used when I uh, designed Bob's logo. And we're going to show you how i done that. Here we use digitizing tablets and, and these kinds of things. And, and oh, don't worry about this. Um, we've had a rash of break-ins lately in, in my city, in my neighborhood. Uh, home invasions. And sometimes they're even doing it when people are home. 
it kind of bothers me to sit back here in my little office in my house and and what what happens if i walk out into another room or not in my basement and, and they're in my house already you know and i don't know i i guess if i was back there and i heard in my office and i heard something going on i'd just dial 911 at that point i mean i'm not foolish but it's that unknown you know a guy wants options and you know the only security system i have is what's provided by smith and wesson right here so I think uh, that's a fairly reliable security system, and, and we're just going to feel a lot better by having that with me back here. And at least until things improve or they catch these jokers, I guess I'd just kind of like to have options. I'm kind of funny that way. Anyways, enough of that. So, I'll open up Illustrator right here. I have kind of the Essentials version, so it has a darker perimeter background on it and uh, older versions may be white but essentially you have the same tools and what's really neat here is is that I can call up my um, my work area and there's my palettes I don't know that you knew this in Photoshop and Illustrator both you can bring out all your individual palettes and link them together in a configuration specifically suited to your design needs. And these are all the palettes that I use. Now, of course, the number one here would be layers, where I can keep track of all my layers. And layers is very important when you're building these graphics, because I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but all the other uh, palettes that I use and all my design work are all here. And it just makes the flow of my, my work so much better when I have access to all those on a different monitor as opposed to having all those pallets over here on my side of my work area like you would if you just had one monitor. And then of course I have the other monitor for reading emails or something like that. One. And it just speeds up my workflow tremendously. Now first of all, I'm going to apologize. I used to have a video screen editing video software Camtasia on this computer, but I don't anymore. And we're just going to have to do this the old fashioned way. And you can do that with an LCD screen because, you know, it doesn't flicker. But I might bump the camera here and there because it's kind of sitting right in front of me here, so bear with me. So the first thing that we do when we want to design these graphics is we all kind of agree on uh, the image that we're going to use. In this particular case, it's that one. This is a full color version. And then we just bring it into the software here because we're going to work with that. And the neat thing about these kind of images is uh, when you bring them in here, <coughs> they're just photographs. You see there? It moves around just like a photograph. And as a result of that, we can scale it any way we want. Now I'll just grab the end of it here and bring it toward. See, now we have a short little stubby B-51. Isn't that kind of silly? And it all depends on how you grab it and where you toggle it. Now we'll have a pancake P-51. That's kind of neat. But if you hold the shift key down and grab the corner of it, you are scaling it proportionally. See how that works? And you can make it any size you want. So what's important to remember here now is, is that once you've decided on your image, then you've got to ask your client, how big his model is? And I asked that of Bob. How big is the model from the end of the cowling here, right behind the spinner, to the tail of the rudder? And he gave me that measurement, and that measurement happens to be 83 inches. So what I do is I come up to my box tool up here on the left and I make a black box at that measurement, that 83 inches. And at that point, we'll go back here a few steps where we were before, and now you notice that my box is totally lined up with the front of the cowl and comes clear back here to the rudder. And then I keep scaling that photograph until it's at the same measurement that my box is, because I have control of either one of these two shapes. There's the box, and there's the photograph. Now once I do that, I take and I click on the photograph, and then I go over here to my <laughs> layers area, and I double click on that one lonely layer, and it brings me up a dialog box where I hit template. And it kind of grays it out to about 60%, but you can gray it out a little bit more. You can take it down to 40% and click on OK. And it just kind of softens the tone of the image that you're tracing on. 
Another thing it does is you'll see right here, there's a little lock icon on there. And that's really kind of neat because when you're sitting here working on top of that, you don't want to bump it and move it when you're sitting here tracing and working on it. You just, you, you want to keep it right where it's at. So when you get, you can move your box out of the way. When you get something designed just exactly where you want it, like the Detroit Miss logo is right here. And I'll zoom in on that a little bit better so you can see it. Yep, you got full zoom capabilities. So while you're working on this stuff, you can completely edit it till it's absolutely 100% perfect and it looks great. So now we know that the image here on the bottom is locked. I'm not going to move it. I can select the Miss Detroit or the Detroit Miss graphic here. And we can just move it out of the way. You see, and there's the underlying one. I know that the font here is just a little different. I didn't have that font. I didn't have the Detroit font either, so I copied that. But the traditional brush script is a little bit more modern script, and it's pretty close. It's a little wider, but it's it's real close, and it, it looks great. Uh, the bomb shape is perfect. I traced it perfectly. Uh, we can get real close with this. There is a bit of a thin black outline on the original artwork too and, and we incorporated that into the design as well so that turned out just great so we'll uh... what Bob has thought is the the height of, of the letters, the new letters we're going to make it need to be 4.25 inches okay and that's not hard to do at all I've already grabbed them and brought them down here and made these two the E and the 2 and we'll go up here and we'll look and you can see right here they are at 4.25 inches now the D has to be 4.25 inches as well but not the line so I can't grab this whole thing and make it 4.25 inches or it'll be too short because just the D is 4.25 inches so what I did was and I'll zoom in on this so you can get a better look at it fill up the screen. Okay, so let's say that the D was, you know, bigger. I just kind of took the D and went over here and lined it up with the top of the two. Okay, and then I just held my shift get button down again and then grabbed this corner toggle and I reduced the D down so it was even with the bottom of the two. So now we know that that is to scale with the E2. And now we know that all of these now are at 4.25 inches where Bob says he needs them. I don't know if they don't look right on his model again, then we'll make another adjustment. So we'll just keep doing this until, until he's happy with the end result. But if he thinks they need to be at 4.25 inches, then that's where we're going to make them. Because we don't argue with the customer. They're always right. And that's the way it is. So at this point... Uh, what I do is, is I have another computer in my shop. I'm in my office. I don't do my design work in my basement. Uh, the basement's for production. All my sh I do all my work in my home. So the, the basement shop is for production. And then we just, because uh, those computers down there that run the cutters are a little more outdated. This is a far more advanced modern computer. It's massive. And it's faster. Uh, plus, I have digital drawing tablets and stuff hooked up to it, so I don't need to use a mouse when I do my work. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, you can sit here with a pen right on the tablet, and, it, and the pen acts like a mouse. And uh, certainly a lot more handier when you're editing in, in programs where you're doing airbrushing and stuff like that, like Photoshop. But it also works with Illustrator too. Uh, it gets that mouse out of your hand and you need something real precise in your hand when you're, when you're doing this kind of, especially when you're tracing and, and doing things that require more intricate uh, work. Doing it with a mouse in your hand is like painting and drawing with a brick. It's just, it's not natural. And holding a, an actual pen in your hand uh, makes things a lot easier. So digitizing tablets uh, still have their place today and, and they work great and and they're awesome. They have a lot of different commands on them here too uh, which speed up the process. So uh, with my left hand I have access to different commands and a rotary wheel here to, to go through different functions on the software 
and uh, the pen has a button on it too that's very similar to the right and left click on the mouse button. So there's right and left click here on the pen tool. And you, you, know, you can use these for web surfing and everything. It's just like a mouse. You're just using it like a pen instead of a mouse. It's just uh, totally awesome. And then of course there's an airbrush tool as well. Uh, it works a lot like an airbrush. So you're just sitting here painting along. You're not spraying anything, but it's a simulated effect. And if you're used to using airbrushes, old school, like I have in the past in design work, then uh, you'll understand the feel of that, the importance of it. All it is is, is it's a familiarity thing. We've had pens and paintbrushes and stuff in our hands ever since we were kids. And that's a familiar thing. So when you're doing something that's requiring a lot more precise work, it's nice to feel that element of precision in your hand as opposed to a big clunky mouth. So what I do now is I generally save this to flash drive and then I take that file down into my shop to my RIP computer and that's where we begin the cutting process. And I'm going to take you down there right now to, to do that. So let's go.